Sticking on voting, you earlier in July, you were down in North Carolina covering the legal battle going on right now for voting rights uh, and, and the and the trial that that that's I, it's it's theoretically ongoing. But like, wh wh where are we right now in the actual trial that's going on down there? So the trial wrapped, and we're just waiting for a decision from the judge and. Because it was a two-week trial with mountains of evidence and testimony, it could be a while. Although the the plaintiffs, the voters, and the voting rights groups are pushing the judge to issue a decision in time so that the laws can be changed uh, and everyone in the state can be educated about those changes in time for the 2016 election. Because sometimes, even when a policy that suppresses votes is struck down and repealed, if people don't know that, they could stay home thinking that they can't vote or they could just be confused or go vote in the wrong place. I mean, we see that um, we see that in many states. And so they're pushing for a decision well in time to get the word out for the 2016 election. So we'll just have to see. But basically, it was um, voters of color in North Carolina suing over the bill, the, the law of the state passed in 2013. They passed it just right after the Supreme Court struck down the key protections in the Voting Rights Act. They would not have been able to pass this law had those protections been in place. Right after those protections fell, they rushed through this law that did a lot of things that disproportionately impact people of color in the state. They got rid of a, a lot of early voting days. They got rid of same-day registration. They got rid of being able to vote out of your precinct. And they got rid of um, a program that pre-registered teens and high schoolers who would turn 18 by the election. And so all of this, you know, had a major impact. And um, because, you know, the justice system is slow, it's taken these two years to finally get before a judge um, and make these arguments. And so we're waiting for a decision on that. And it really could impact cases around the country because this is sort of a test case of how strong is the Voting Rights Act without Section 4. Right. Um, Congress, the U.S. Congress, has not acted on the various bills introduced to restore Section 4, restore those protections. And so we still have protections left in the Voting Rights Act under Section 2, but will those protections mean anything? This case could really answer that question. Yeah, I mean, reading the article when you, I mean, you were at the trial, just mm -hmm. listening to, uh, you covered the testimony of some of these people who literally were disenfranchised. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's so, t tell the, tell some of their stories because it's like, in some ways when we talk about this, it's a little, it can kind of be abstract, but like literally you had people testifying to this judge, I was disenfranchised because of this horrible law. Tell us a couple of the stories down there. Sure, and um, when I was listing the provisions, I, I left out almost, you know, one of the most important ones, which was a strict voter ID law, which, right. you know, we were just talking about the impact that can have. And so what you see with a lot of this is, um, you know, uh, elected officials like to say, well, you know, I have an ID. Everybody I know has an ID. I need my ID to buy a beer or get on an airplane. It's ridiculous that anyone wouldn't have it. And those people just aren't hearing from people who are not like them. And so at this trial, we had testimony from folks who live far out in the country. They don't, they can't drive, so they don't have a driver's license, and they can't drive themselves to you know, get an ID. They might not have a birth certificate because they were born at home to a midwife and um, and thus don't have the proper documentation to get an ID. Um, one person who testified is, is illiterate. I mean, we still have that in America and that's something people need to think about and that, you know, we abolished literacy tests for voting yeah. <laughs> thanks to the civil rights movement. Right. And so that, you know, being poor, being illiterate, living in a, you know, there are measures passed that were meant to get as many people to the polls as possible, and those measures were working, and now we're seeing them get repealed. Yeah, and you also recently just wrote another piece specifically dealing with North Carolina on how this is really affecting, obviously, the poor, people who can't afford ID, who also can, maybe can't afford transportation to get ID, yes. don't have uh, birth certificates, etc. But it's mm -hmm. also greatly affecting veterans as well, mm -hmm. correct? 
Yes, and that um, that article was focused on a separate issue that could become a, a court case in, in the coming months or years. Um, right now, it's uh, in the complaint stage before the state, but it's another way that North Carolina is making it more difficult for people to vote, specifically to register the vote. A bunch of voting rights groups are saying that they have vital, violated um, the National Voter Registration Act, which is separate from the Voting Rights Act, um, because... That law it was passed in the 90s, said that anytime somebody goes to a DMV or like a social services agency, like to sign up for food stamps, for instance, or to sign up for Medicare, that they should always be asked, are you registered to vote? Here is the form. Um, do you need to update your registration? Have you moved? And just in so many instances, North Carolina is failing to meet those obligations. And they, um, these organizations, Project Vote, Demos, and some others, have done some fantastic investigations on this. They have a chart showing um, the number of voter registrations at those social service agencies over time by year. And you see it just take a huge plunge when the current governor, McCrory, came into office. And so that that's being investigated right now. They're having that come complaint to the state. And you brought up veterans. So the reason it impacts veterans, North Carolina has a lot of major, um, you know, uh, has a huge veteran population, has a lot of military bases. And veterans move around a lot. And, you know, current service members have to move around a lot. And when it's harder for them to update their registration and make sure that they are squared away to vote, then that really has an impact. And I spoke to a woman who's if this goes to trial, will be one of the main plaintiffs who is a veteran. And she just is, she's so angry um, that she was not able to register and cast her ballot. She said, you know, I risk my life for this country. I, you know, served in the military and this is the thanks I get. So that's one on the horizon to really keep an eye on. Yeah, it's, it's just disgusting uh, that, that in 2015, we literally have a party that really doesn't actually believe that everybody has the right to vote and like I, I, I like that th that consistently do everything they can to make it harder for people to vote instead of actually trying to encourage people to vote they do everything they can uh passing laws passing ids uh, it, it's just it's so undemocratic uh, uh, that it's insane one more aspect that you covered when you were down in north carolina which also has to do with representation is gerrymandering. And in North mm -hmm. Carolina, the gerrymandering is nuts. Tell us about that. Well, this was focused on a local gerrymandering issue um, in the city of Greensboro. Greensboro, historic hotbed of civil rights activism. The famous lunch counter sit-in happened there um, that desegregated the Woolworths counter. Um, and so they were facing a gerrymandering that came from the state level. The state passed a bill to gerrymander their local city council races targeting just Greensboro out of the whole state. And it would have redistricted so that all of the African-American city council members would have to run against each other um, and you know, compete for, for the same areas. Um, luckily, that was just struck down by a court and will not be going forward, although there might be further legal appeals and whatnot. But for now, it is not going forward. Alice Olstein, reporter for Think Progress. You can find all of her reporting at thinkprogress.org. You can follow her on Twitter at Alice Olstein. Alice, as always, really, really important stuff. Thank you for your reporting, and thanks for being on the show again. Thank you so much.